Look at questions 1 to 7. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good times holidays. John speaking. How may I help you? Oh, hello. I'm calling to complain about a holiday we've just had. Oh, dear. I'm sorry to hear about that. Yes, we're very disappointed. What I need to do is to take some information from you so that I can look up the relevant files and then we can discuss the specific problems. Would that be all right with you? Yes, I hope it doesn't take too long. Oh, no. Let me just get a form ready. First, the name, please, of the person who booked the holiday. Well, our surname's Sharp. S-H. Like a knife? Yes, but with an E on the end. And a first name? I'm Alice, but I think it was my husband who actually booked the trip. His name's Andrew. Fine. And then the address, please. It's flat 4, Beaconsfield. That's B-E-A-C-O-N-S-F-I-E-L-D. House. That's Winchester. And it's S-O-2, um, 4-E-R. Thank you. And could I take a telephone number? We're on 0374 565 at home. Or do you mean during the day? Then my work number's 0374 993 I'll put the work one down, assuming that's normal office hours. Oh, yes. The next thing is, do you have a note of your booking reference? I think so. Uh, would it start 7-4? Uh, no. Usually with two or three letters. Uh-huh. Oh, is this it? M-H? That sounds like it. And then double six G-4. Thank you. Right, what's next? Uh-huh. Now, did you book in conjunction with any kind of special offer? Uh... Or did you book directly with us? Or maybe through a scheme your employer's part of? Oh, OK. No, I think... Yes, we were using an offer from a credit card company. They always seem to have offers on. You get something with every bill, don't you? Yes, so many. Fine. And now, insurance. Did you have an insurance policy that came with your booking? Well, no. I mean, it came under our Gold Star policy, so we didn't need extra. No, that's fine. It's just a check. All right, nearly there. Now, what type of holiday was it? Well, not very... No, OK. It was called a midwinter break in the brochure. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. And when was the holiday? We just got back on January the 21st and we started on the 16th. Fine. Right. I'm sorry about all that. No, I understand. So, what was the problem you encountered? There were two things that disappointed us, actually. Right. In the first place... We were told that when we arrived at the station, a taxi would meet us and take us straight to the house. But in fact, there wasn't one there. We had to wait for ages and then pay for one ourselves. So that was inconvenient and expensive. Oh, I'll look into that, see what went wrong. And the other problem was that we'd been promised there would be a bicycle for each of us stored at the house, ready to use. 
but they were only three, which is no good for a family of four. No, it wouldn't be. OK, well, I'll check into that as well. Now, if you can give me a few hours, I'll get back to you this afternoon, and then we can discuss... That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a student housing officer giving a talk to a group of university students concerning dormitory renovations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. After months of discussion and planning, we are very pleased to announce that the renovations will be made to the west wing of the university dormitories. Now, with this good news comes some bad, as there will be some disruptions to your living environment. But we think once you hear our plans, you're going to be very happy with what we will be doing. Firstly, if you'll just take a moment to look at the plans we gave you as you came in. Firstly, on the eastern side of the wing, you'll notice that there will be a change in the existing front entrance. It will be removed to another location on the opposite side of the wing. I'm sure that a lot of you will be glad for that, as our present configuration didn't allow for enough lighting. With the renovations will also come the removal of the existing staircase, but not the column beside it. Now, as we move west, we come to the location of the new security entrance. As with the old one, there will still be a need for some new lighting, so we're planning to install a number of overhead lights, which will make entering and exiting safer for you all. It'll be at this new security entrance that the new wall will be built to a two-story height. This gives you an idea of the size of the construction. Overall, the width will be around six meters, with the overall length being around 10, which I'm sure many of you are going to really enjoy. More room for all of you living in the West Wing. Are there any questions? Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, as I mentioned, there will be some issues we will have to overcome regarding the renovations. The first will be relocating some of you to new dormitories. 30 students will be moving for a total of six weeks. Now, of those who will be moving, you will be distributed to three other temporary locations, the north, south, and east dorm wings. Ten students will be relocated to each wing. 
This means that some of you are going to need to get packing. Don't worry about your new location. We're doing all we can to make your new temporary dorms as comfortable as possible. In fact, as I speak, we're making steps to ensure that you have study desks, lamps, and computer facilities, and all of the other facilities you require to successfully continue on with your studies. We're even repainting several of the rooms in the preparation for your arrival. The changes to your dorms will be starting within a week. If you have any problems, don't hesitate to contact my office. Now I'm sure some of you have questions. I'm happy to answer them now. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a discussion between two students, David and Jane, and their tutor, Dr Wilson, about their group research project into local history. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, David, Jane. Hello. Hi. So, how's the local history project going? Are you making good progress? Yes and no. Oh? Well, we anticipated problems of various kinds. None of the group has much experience of collaborating on projects. But we spent some time discussing how to go about it and thrashed out what seemed a useful approach. But it seems that Jane and I are the only ones actually following the plan. That's meant that the whole project has been lacking coordination, and so we've fallen behind our schedule. I see. That's tricky. Yes, it is. We felt that the targets had been defined, so we'd all know what to deal with. But looking back, we probably should have really specified individual responsibilities. As it is, we only have a loose sense of what should be done by who. Well, this is quite a common problem, actually. I take it that you've had enough group meetings, so you're looking for an effective solution. If you go to the Resource Center, I think you'd find the advice service they provide there helpful at this point. Thanks. We'll go there later. On a specific note... I think we've got carried away with recruiting people to interview at the expense of building up the reference section, which I don't think is going to be solid enough. Do you think that'll be a major problem? Hmm. I'd have to see how much is there to be sure. But, well, you'll have to be pragmatic at this point, I think. What you'd better do is ensure your methodology is really strong, so at least you can't be faulted on that front. Then, if people challenge your results... At least you've carefully reported how you reach them. Do you see what I mean? Yes. yes. So? Yes, I think one resource in relation to that that we haven't exploited as fully as we might is the Internet. I've taken a lot of journals off the library shelves to go through, but actually there are websites where you can call up lists of approaches or data sets really quickly. I think that's a good idea, yes. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, let's think about the field trip and at least make sure that goes as well as possible. You're going to Cambridge on the 22nd. The Monday, yes. It's quite soon now. And in the morning, you'll be travelling and then getting settled into the hotel. Uh Uh-huh. But you need to get down to work after lunch, of course. Now, I've arranged for you to have a look at some useful visual material, especially photographs and old magazines and newspapers, which is included in an exhibition at the library in the university. That sounds like a good starting point. There's quite a lot on show, so that'll occupy most of the afternoon. Then the following morning, I want you to go and talk to someone in the city library. His name's Jarvis Gregson. He works in the education section there, and he's an expert on the area's history. Don't, of course, forget to take a tape recorder with you so that you can record what he tells you. Mm -hmm. And to have our questions ready. Indeed. Okay, and the afternoon's free for you to wander around, get the feel of the place. Do some sightseeing. As you wish. It's a beautiful city. Mm. But it's back to work on Wednesday morning. Concentrate on the central area and walk around methodically. You'll have the plans I'm getting ready for you from different periods, and your task is to compare those with the makeup of the city today. Make notes on how different kinds of shops and businesses have grown up, what's gone, and so on. I hope the weather's good. (laughs) Yes, uh, and in the afternoon, I want you to think about producing your own records, along the lines of the ones in the city library's archives. The history of the castle is very important to the city's development, so use a camera to get some pictures that reflect that, if you can, showing it in relation to the buildings and spaces around it. We'll try. And when do we travel back? That's up to you. You can either decide to... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. 
Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers fishing crews and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter, they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard-packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six-meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move, looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns in housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
To effectively solve list of headings questions in the IELTS reading section, begin by thoroughly understanding the question type, which requires matching headings to specific paragraphs that summarize their main ideas. Start by skimming the passage to grasp its overall topic and structure, focusing on the first and last sentences of each paragraph, as these often contain key ideas. Identify the main ideas by locating topic sentences, which usually convey the essence of each paragraph, while also considering supporting details for context. Next, review the list of headings, noting keywords and potential synonyms or paraphrases that might relate to the paragraph content. Begin matching headings to paragraphs by starting with clear connections and using a process of elimination for more challenging ones, ensuring that each match accurately reflects the context and tone of the paragraph. After making your initial matches, double-check them for consistency and clarity, and practice regularly with diverse texts to build familiarity with different writing styles. Finally, analyze any mistakes to identify patterns and adjust your strategies accordingly, which will enhance your ability to tackle these questions effectively on test day.